right, we're hot. Good afternoon, everyone. It is noon, so we will uh, kick this off. Randy Pugh, director of the Naval Warfare Studies Institute. This is the second in a series uh, about uh, innovation in, uh, in combat. So the idea is looking at the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, you know, nothing stimulates your creativity like somebody trying to kill you. And all the things that are being done in Ukraine that uh, we should be paying attention to um, uh, as we think about future concepts and capabilities. So the first one was, uh, was Robots and Drones uh, by uh, Professor Don Brutzman. And today we have Professor uh, Chris Paul, who is here to talk about deception and decoys, which if you've been paying attention to the news, just some really clever and interesting things happening in Ukraine. This is a, uh, as a um, public service announcement in two weeks. The next one will be the use of commercial space in Ukraine. So that'll be, I think everyone knows about, uh, about uh, SpaceX and Starlink and how the Ukrainians have used that as a command and control platform. Uh, but also things like uh, the use of commercial imagery uh, and how that plays into uh, to the war in Russia and Ukraine. And then two weeks after that, uh, just before uh, we break for Christmas, uh, John Hammerer will be presenting uh, on um, missiles and, uh, and the use of missiles in the, in the Russia-Ukraine war. So it should be uh, another good uh, presentation. If you have any feedback, I appreciate it, even negative feedback. Uh, I'll give that to Chris but uh, ways that we can make this better. So the intent is for it to be interesting and engaging, uh, and then also to support your uh, education and research that you're doing either as consumers or producers, uh, so, that, uh, so that it's all mutually supporting and gets better over time. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Chris Paul, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I, I wasn't aware there'd be an introduction, so I prepared a slide since I'm relatively new on campus. I've been on deck about three months. My position is the newest warfighting chair position. I'm the uh, Deputy Commandant for Information Sponsored Marine Corps Information Chair here at Naval Postgraduate School. And I, I come to NPS from more than 20 years at the RAND Corporation doing a wide range of defense related research, including research into all aspects of information warfare, including some stuff on deception. Uh, this briefing is on classified. Please for oh. tech, audio chat. Audio chat. Okay. All right. You can hear me, hear me, hear me. Okay, good. Uh, well, that's good to know. So yeah, right. the, this, this briefing is unclassified. I imagine it would be possible to escape those bounds. So my slides are all unclassified, but I'm hoping we have a conversation. So just be mindful of the things that you talk about, please. Uh, and I don't care if I don't get through all of my slides. If we get sidetracked talking about something interesting, that's a good thing. And I would consider that a productive use of the hour we have together. So please feel free to butt in, share, ask questions, make commentary. Uh, we'll get we'll get all all through it. So who who are we talking about? We're talking about both the Russians and the Ukrainians in the, the Ukraine AOR and some in Russia. Uh, but let's go through some of the what. What kinds of things have we seen two sides doing? Uh, well, here is some examples of Ukrainian small-scale tactical infantry decoys uh, assembled with gear and or mannequins, pretty small scale, pretty rudimentary, not going to stand up to particularly close scrutiny, but from a reasonable standoff, a uh, quickly, quickly passing drone or something could easily mistake one of these as an actual soldier. Uh, also see early, oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, anecdotally, would you say this on what scale are, are you seeing this, or, or are they seeing this in onesies, twosies, hundreds? I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, again, limited to, to unclassified reporting. This has been in the news. I've seen several reports of these at several different times. So it's it's obviously something that is ongoing, but I don't I don't have a sense of the scale. Does anybody else have a sense of the scale of use of, of mannequin level decoys? Uh, I, my sense is that this was kind of improvisational, uh, that this isn't something that there's major production for. It's just kind of things of opportunity. Oh, look, there's a department store. They probably won't be using their mannequins. Hey, who's got some spare gear? Let's dress one up. Oh, that's pretty good. I'd rather that get shot than me. Uh, that kind of scale of things. Uh, uh, similarly, early on in the conflict, we saw some somewhat primitive use of decoys. Hey, we got this old car. Let's set it up to look like, uh, I think this is a, an S22. Uh, 
this isn't bad, right? The coloring is right. The general shape is right. It's a vehicle. You could still turn that on and drive it down the street so it's easy to move. Uh, if you leave it on and idling, it's still producing a thermal signature. Maybe not the right thermal signature, but again, quick, quick drone flyby, uh, spotting that in a in a reasonably plausible position. Uh, it's it, it, it looks like something. Maybe it looks like what it's supposed to. It definitely looks like some kind of weapon system. Uh, then we get to more sophisticated decoys. Last year, 2022, started seeing articles about this. So this is from a Czech factory that is producing decoys. Uh, this one's a, a high Mars looking decoy. Uh, the implication being that Ukraine was buying these Czech decoys and probably using it. I don't have any unclassified photography of this particular decoy being employed in Ukraine. But the inference is that it is. Uh, we know with pretty high confidence that Ukraine is using some kind of HIMARS decoys because the Russians have claimed to destroy more HIMARS than we have sent them. So the fact that there are still, that that claim has been made and HIMARS are still being fired suggests that some kind of decoy action is, is working. Uh, we've also seen much more sophisticated decoys. So the image on the left is a real gun. The image on the right is a bunch of decoys. The pixelation and the blurring is just for OPSEC, so they're not revealing anything about the environment where these were all produced, uh, which is, I think, a good measure. But take out the pixelation. It's a, it's a pretty good decoy. It's got probably real rubber tires. It's got... Uh, uh, what are, the, what are those called? Breach vents? Muzzle the, brake. Mu muzzle brake. There we go. War word. It's got muzzle brakes. Uh, there's other little widgets and gigas on the, the, what's the front plate called? He's called widgets and gigas or whatever. Well, the, but the, I'm, I'm, the widgets and gigas I'm happy with. The, uh, the plate itself. The, is yeah. that a, a, a blast plate? Uh, anyway, whatever. The, the front plate. Uh, and as you can see, so this, this is from uh, in August of this year, Ukraine allowed a bunch of journalists to tour the factory at which they were making decoys. And they showed off things like this, like this, this blast plate with a bunch of different, so this is, this is uh, I think this is foam core, but they work with plywood and foam core and a bunch of other stuff. And then when they paint it, they get to some really good looking decoys. Now, this is an interesting choice in the broader deception context to show off the factory. So now remember, this is this is in August and then published in September of this year, more than a year into the conflict. So decoys have been in use for quite a while. So think about the I know that you know that I know game that goes on when you show off your decoy making capability. And think about the, the layers that that gets to. But but yeah, they showed off a capability to make very sophisticated looking decoys. Uh, and here, here are some examples from that same factory, not vehicle decoys, but like a, a little radar station decoy and some other kind of portable control decoy that again, look pretty good. Uh, you get up close enough, you can you can tell it's not authentic, but has has the right silhouette, has has the right kind of shapes and things. And then, of course, I don't have any pictures of good plywood and foam core high Mars decoys, and not so not the Czech inflatable ones. But the the story says the Ukrainians are making using the same modeling approach, using the same uh, crafting approach as those guns that were depicted earlier for high Mars, and again enjoying some success with high Mars decoys. Uh, given that the Russians claim to have destroyed more, more HIMARS than the Ukrainians have received. Uh, let's switch to Russia. What kinds of decoys has Russia been using? Well, one of the things Russia has been using is these cool uh, fake missiles that they send along in a barrage as one more thing in the air when you go to run your missile defense. Uh, if if you happen to shoot down one of these, Russia doesn't care. Uh, there's, there's a limit. So the idea is to saturate the missile defenses so that a larger number of your missiles get through. These are called penetration aids. So here, 
here is clear evidence that Russia has been using these penetration aids because they've shot down, fallen, been shot down, fallen out of the air, been recovered, whatever. There they are, and they've been using them for a while. Here's another interesting one that that Russia did. So this is a real bridge, but next to it are a whole bunch of little metal radar deflectors with the idea being that it creates a radar signature that looks a lot like the bridge. So if you're using some kind of radar to detect or target the bridge, you either get the wrong image or you get a double image. Uh, we also know that Russia is using fake inflatable tanks. Uh, so here's overhead imagery of a real tank. Here's the fake tank. Uh, there, the Ukrainians spotted some fake tanks deployed not very well. Like one of them was partially inflated, and one of them was parked not in particularly good cover, and it didn't have any fake tank tracks behind it. So it was pretty easily picked out as a decoy. And of course, as the Ukrainians are so good at, there, there was social media mockery associated with this, like, here's an image, ha ha, Russians are such clowns, they don't even know how to use fake tanks, right? Except that presumably sometimes they do know how to use fake tanks, right? That they, they inflate them properly, they put them in useful positions uh, and take advantage of that. So they, they have that equipment, they're using it. Uh, another one that is a little more sinister and has greater effect uh, in their extensive trench works, the Russians have been digging false trench trenches near their trenches, leaving them un unoccupied except for mining them. So when the Ukrainians get into the trench and start to clear it, uh, the, the Russians detonate it. Uh, also, some use of decoys in the Russian rear area at their airfields. Now, this isn't particularly sophisticated. Basically, they just painted the silhouette of this bomber on the runway. In this particular piece of imagery, it's pretty damn obvious because there's a real one parked there and it has a shadow. But this isn't as bad as it seems on its face because on a cloudy day when nothing has a shadow, these two things start looking a lot more similar. Or, uh, if this isn't parked here and you just have those there, that's something. Uh, I read some suppositional analysis about this exact imagery that suggested that maybe these were supposed to be more extensive decoys, that perhaps someone in charge of base security had probably received some money to build some decoys to protect this rather large bomber that's hard to get under hardened cover, and maybe had spent that money on something else or put it in their own bank account and then had to come up with something and so got out there and used reflective paint and painted some silhouettes. Uh, so this, this is pretty low tech and, and relatively unimpressive, but again, something we have clear public source, open source uh, documentary evidence taking place. What else? What other fun shenanigans have you heard either side getting up to? I would assume that similar to the Balkans war in the 90s, um, some of the low tech things was just putting like a log on a trailer to look like an artillery piece. The Americans sent in tomahawks uh, after things like this and, and wasted considerable organs on that. Yeah, so so kind of World War II era shadow army in England, yeah. uh, some something something that is log -li a log like barrel and something that looks like wheels or a carriage, not too sophisticated. So even less sophisticated than an inflatable. Yeah. Uh, my understanding is we're not seeing too much of that simply because a lot of the the observation that is available is a little too close for that to work well, that you really knew, do need to, to gussy it up a little bit and get a little closer to the right silhouette. But I'm sure there's there's some of that, as witnessed by the mannequins, right? That's that's kind of that same level of fidelity that's at. That's at. It's at kind of the right shape. And for a fleeting glance, that's really all you need. Uh, what else? What other kinds of things have we seen? Yep. I have a question. Have most of these decoys been are pretty much just to draw fire, make them waste ammunition, or has there been any done on a scale like with the Shadow Army thing that's like, pretty, like a strategic impact uh, that new forces are trying to 
We will talk a whole bunch about why, about what you might gain through decoys and what they have been gained through decoys. But my understanding is it's not big strategic level stuff, but it is definitely kind of kind of tactical level stuff. Hey, this this formation is over here rather than over here. You should be looking over here. Stuff at the, the tactical level to get a, a directly opposed formation to orient in the wrong direction rather than, uh, that, oh my gosh, we need to, to defend our flank because there's this whole non-existent force in that direction. Uh, certainly an interesting thing <clears throat> with the fake HIMARS, the range of a HIMARS, something on the order of 50 miles, if you push forward a bunch of fake ones, not only do you draw fire and get the enemy to waste ammunition on that, if they've got stuff that they're afraid of having shot by a HIMARS, they might oh, pack it up and move it out. And that I think has been, been an intentional thing that, Hey, if we if we create a high Mars threat with fake high Mars in an area where we're not actually willing to risk real high Mars, we can we can indicate a, a threat radius around that that can can have broader effects. So, Dr. Paul, on that image that you showed at the bridge that had the uh, pylons or whatever it was using to give that false signal have they done any of the russians done anything like that for any of their uh sebastopol fleet or anything any ships is is that thing i have no idea uh, i assume some kind of radar decoys are part of their standard na naval defensive arsenal but again photography and open source reporting on that is not something i've seen much of but certainly if they're doing it here that suggests something like that and let's think about what we know about waveforms and radar and, and things like this. Much easier to make clutter in an already cluttered environment, right? The terrestrial environment has all kinds of crap in it that can send radar and visual returns. Out on the ocean, much less crap. So it's it, the, that has trade-offs in terms of, of your decoys, right? If you have a good-looking one uh, that sends a lot of the right kinds of returns and signals, it can be pretty good looking. But something something relatively low tech is less likely to be successful. Do you have any uh, examples? So imitative communications deception, this idea of using you know emitters that would look like a radio net associated with some echelon of military command or something like that. Do you have any examples at the unclassified level of that? Uh, the one I'm aware of is stuff in using stuff in combination. <clears throat> so if you have a bunch of decoys that won't survive close scrutiny, to couple that with a nice tight EW net, reducing the likelihood of close scrutiny. Or uh, another another reason to push the high Mars for it and kind of kind of anti-air or false anti-air is to keep the enemy who, who in, in this conflict, the Russians still have air superiority, but it's tenuous. There, there's IADs in, in Ukraine. So the Russian pilot's inclination is if, they, if they've been called to serve as some target, to, be, to have as great a standoff as possible, pickle off whatever they're going to fire and get the hell out of there. And, and the cat and mouse game with the Ukrainians pushing forwards IADs or the semblance of IADs to keep that maximum standoff because... Missiles, missiles fired from airframes at maximum distance are less likely to be effective, give a longer to longer time on target chance for intercept and all kinds of other other defensive advantages. Uh, go on the other way. If Ukraine is is firing missiles at the Russian rear area or back into Russia, uh, they want to they want to do do decoys of that as well. So they might send something up initially to stimulate uh, Russian air defenses get them to illuminate, followed by maybe some harm or some kind of anti-radiation mission missile that's gonna gonna attrit some of those those air defenses, and then whatever their actual package is. So kind of layered incremental things relying on decoys as part of the package. In terms of actual comms and EW stuff, I don't know that much about that, but. Have you seen anything on that? Uh, I'm sure that's going on. I don't know the extent of it or the effectiveness of it. Chris, Chris, this is Sheila. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Well, hello. Very interesting. But I had a question on disinformation campaigns. I know they're not the traditional definition of 
of a decoy, but they are a decoy. So can you say something about Russia's disinformation campaigns? Uh, I can say something about uh, you know, the, the, the campaign elements of the Ukrainian choice to show this factory, right? So, so this isn't disinformation, this is real information. But in a, if you think about perception management, about your decision to reveal or conceal your capabilities. So for a long time, Ukraine was just using the decoys and letting Russians blow them up and laughing about it. But then at some point, either it became obvious enough to the Russians or, or something that they decided that it would be a good idea to reveal that they had this capability. So this was obviously a conscious decision. They invited a bunch of news agencies to tour this facility. So this, this appeared, this and very similar photographs appeared in a bunch of different news outlets. So they clearly had, had brought in August of this year, a bunch of, of folks in to tour that. It wasn't investigative journalism that, that some journalist found some decoy, oh, that's something else. This, this decoy company, they keep bringing back the, the broken pieces of their decoys to the, to the Ukrainian MOD to show off, look, look, we got them to blow up this. They, they actually believed it, they blew it up. And then, yeah, the MOD will come back and say, okay, we need something like this, make us about 50. Yeah, bring your guys over and we'll show you a real one. And you can take pictures of it and then go back to the shop. But the, I think it was a really interesting choice to do this. So what does this, what does this do? Well, it showcases to the inter, international community how robust and resilient Ukraine is and gives us another raw, raw, go Ukraine moment. But obviously it also signals to the Russians, hey, yeah, we've got some pretty sophisticated decoys. Maybe you want to be more careful with what you're shooting at. And I think it opens up a real interesting opportunity. What if you take a real gun and you put some plywood and some fake gigas on it? Now, some Russian loitering drone sees it and the operators like double check it and like, hey, get a little closer. Oh, yeah, I see. I see some plywood. I think it's a fake. Hmm. What if it isn't? Now, now there's some risk involved in that, right? If you if you put your real gun in a place where it can be seen by a drone, you know there's a chance that you're you're too clever by half, and they service it anyway. Uh, but yeah, there's there's definitely something. I mean, we could have a, a conversation about disinformation, but that would be a a whole different conversation. So I'd rather stay focused on deep voice. Okay. Uh, other decoys that you've heard or seen about? I think you I think with some of these examples, you have if you have your two basic forms of deception, misdirection and concealment. Uh, with these nice decoys, you actually have a blend of both. So the, the nice example of the artillery piece, you could have artillery wide ones next to the fake ones. And what you really, what I think the, the factory tour may have a plausible potential explanation would be um, just to increase the uncertainty, or, you know, increase the loiter time. Yeah, no, fair enough. Right. And I think we've definitely seen some of that of of making a a small detachment look bigger. Uh, and and so again, if 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 it's observed then if you're, if you're picking precision targets, you may pick the wrong one, but it still does present some kind of credible combat threat. It's often, you know, it's usually either misdirect or concealed. But here, you're providing examples of plausibility of the blending that is. Well, well thank you. And, and that's a great segue into talking a bit about why. What do we, what do we want from decoys? So there's the, the basic, uses of decoys kind of as a as a force protection major as as distraction if you're if you're shooting at a decoy you're not shooting at the real one um, if you're shooting at the decoy you're wasting ammunition and, and and one of the big lessons i think from the broader ukraine crown fit is the importance of magazine depth uh russia's only got so many precision guided missiles and and only so much factory throughput and so every one that they put on a hunk of plywood is a big win for the for ukraine uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a perception of force multiplier. You can park a a whole battery of fake guns and it looks like you've got a bunch of guns. You can you can park two real guns with six or seven fake guns and it looks like an even bigger battery and you've still got some combat capability. And you can put forces fake forces in the field and seem like you have presence where you do not. And some of these other more advanced things that we've mentioned, 
if you if you push a threat envelope forward, even if it's just simulated, you can cause the enemy to pull back to safer positions out of range. Uh, you can you can use it as bait. So the artillery duel is is all about fire and and counter battery fire. So if you can if you can wheel some fake guns into place and you can get the Russians to find them with drones or whatever, and then open up with their artillery, now that gives you a counter-battery fire opportunity. And there are other kinds of, of baits. So the, the false Russian trench that's mined with explosives, that is a trap, that is a form of bait. And then we already talked about this, this double bluff opportunity, this, this you know that I know that you know. So, okay, we've shown off our our decoy factory will continue to make really high quality decoys, but then we also might put some decoy bits on some of our real equipment to make you second guess whether that's real or not. And we could talk more about other kinds of things, but let's let's spend a minute thinking about how well these different decoys stand up to what kind of scrutiny. So starting with the, the good old Mark I eyeball, you know, straight up observation, maybe aided by binoculars or not. Again, if you get a, a, a good long look at some of these things, up close, well, if you get up close, it's pretty obvious. But at a distance with the naked eye, especially those, those factory decoys, the, the guns built with, with all the little bumps and, and bits out of foam core and plywood, those look pretty good. You have to get pretty close before you can tell that those are not real. And if you look at them through IR, they do not have you know, their, their foam core. They have a foam core signature, whereas a, a real gun probably has a different signature. Uh, some of the inflatables come with some kind of motorized packet in them that maybe emits some other kinds of signals. So again, you're not, if you get close enough to it, you can tell, oh, it's kind of got that rounded rubbery look like an inflatable. But at a greater standoff and with other kinds of sensors, it might show up with greater, greater verisimilitude. Uh, thinking about things from overhead observation. So satellite high altitude overflight. Uh, there we're worried about things like shadow. Anything that has dimensionality produces shadow. It has to have kind of the right dimensions. Uh, but some of, these, some of these decoys, almost any of these decoys can be pretty good for, for overhead observation until we start folding in other kinds of, of spectrum. Uh, drone cameras, now this, the, I think this, this dovetails nicely with, with uh, Dr. Brutzman's talk from last week about the heavy use of drones and kind of the, the combination of drones for observation and the EW fight, kind of the, the drone guns and the counter drone fight. Uh, fleeting glances from drones, Drone camera, the angle sometimes can be bad. The standoff can be some kind of bad. It doesn't take much of a decoy to trick a quick flight by, by a drone, especially if, if you have to operate your, you know, if, if you have time, if no one is shooting at you and you can move your drone to the perfect observation position and no one is jamming your ability to control it or its ability to transmit back to, back to base what it's found, it would be a pretty good tool for ferreting out what's real or what's not. But it isn't like that. Got to move your drone fast. You got to keep it moving. You have, have limited limited time on target. Uh, so limited loiter time. So even if you go back over the footage carefully, which presumably some some analyst might be inclined to do, sometimes it's kind of grainy. Sometimes there's some some interruption. Uh, and again, time sensitive. We're not leaving these things in position indefinitely. Uh, there's there's some limitations to that. Now, when you start to get radars involved and you start to get infrared involved maybe the equations change a little bit. Uh, again, the just having infrared really changes the game a bunch. Uh, so drones with infrared capability see through a lot of decoys pretty easily. But at the end of the day, distance and time matter. How close you can get and how long you can look at something with whatever observation system you're using it's going to have a huge impact on your ability to discriminate whether a decoy is, is real or false. Uh, other things that matter when trying to make your decoy believed. The, we just talked about the various uh, reflections or emissions that it makes, what its thermal, thermal signature looks like. 
but also the context. If it's a vehicle, if you don't put tracks behind it, that's a pretty dead giveaway. Uh, if you don't make any effort to camouflage it, that's a pretty dead giveaway. Whereas in this in this fight where we're closing complex kill webs and, and to be seen is to be shot at within certain range of the front, uh, just parking a gun out in the middle of a field is probably not particularly plausible, especially a high Mars. You're some high value thing if there's just one of those parked in the middle of a field that's not in trees, it's not in cover, that's not got some camouflage netting. But again, these are these are fairly easy things to fix. Well, plausible vehicle treads is a little harder to fix. Right? You need a vehicle or some some clever grass stomping to make that. But things like the where whether what if you put your decoy in a partially concealed condition, if you imagine, okay, I'm I want this decoy, it's okay if this decoy is seen, but I'm gonna pretend like I'm trying to hide it. Uh, that that can be a giveaway. And again, then there's the you know that I know that you know. So maybe in an environment where Ukrainians are known to have high quality high Mars decoys, maybe occasionally you can just park one in the middle in the middle of a field. And some Russian drone operator sees that and it's like, oh, and I'm like, wait a minute, there's no way there's a real high Mars parked in the middle of a field. Except maybe today there is. Seems kind of risky, but you take some risks in deception. So let's let's think about the use of decoys in the broader realm of deception and strategy. So the, the deception mantra is see, think, do. So clearly a decoy is right at the beginning of that, see, what do I have to show the adversary to get them to think what I want them to think and then do what I want them to do, whether that's waste of munition or, or orient in a different direction or whatever it is that I want them to do. Uh, so if it's about do, deception is about trying to get your adversary to do or not do, to decide to do or not do something. Either want them to do something that is not to their advantage or not like waste of munition or not do something that is to their advantage, like service a valid target because they think it's a decoy. Uh, that could include a wider range of things, and we can think about which, which of those kinds of things decoys might be useful to. I have some kind of wordy slides drawn from uh, <clears throat> drawn from broader discussions on deception, but basically you, you use deception to manipulate the apparent alternatives available to the adversary and their, and their relative attractiveness. Uh, or create surprise. So here are Jones's eight principles of deception, and decoys can contribute to most of these. That you are somewhere other than where you, where they expect you to be. Decoy presence elsewhere makes them think you're there. Uh, your weapons and forces are different than what they are. You can have decoys of systems you don't even have, or that you don't have in those numbers. Or you can you can increase you inflate the the size of your your apparent forces. Uh, you intend to do something else. Again, if you posture decoys in a way that looks like they're going to protect an area or advance into an area that you're not going to advance into, you're, you're creating that kind of deception. Yeah, Ian? One that's not up there is firm the, the enemy's most likely or most dangerous force. Back. In other words, the decoy or the larger deception concept feed into the enemy's Election plan, which then feeds the decision support template, which then feeds the, the idea that hey, which course of action are we going towards? I think when I when I look at all those slides, yeah, this is get down into specifics of uh, specific indicator requirements in a collection plan. Like, okay, this is really where we can feed them what they want to see. No, absolutely. Uh, uh, confirming mistaken suppositions, yeah, right? And this is another first principle of deception. The easiest deception gets the adversary to believe what they already believe. Yeah. It confirms that belief. So when we talk about the two main types of, of deception, ambiguity increasing and ambiguity decreasing. We only want to decrease ambiguity if the, the adversary is under a mistaken impression. We want to reinforce that mistaken impression. And yeah, Jones, Jones' presentation seems to be 
focus more on what's different than what you're actually doing. So yeah, you want to you want the deception to be something other than what you're actually doing. But I think a better focus is on what does the enemy already believe? Am I trying to reinforce that belief, or am I trying to cause them to change that belief? Right? If they're if they're flying drones over an area because they think we have forces there, well, wouldn't it be great if we had some decor forces there for them to find? Because now all of their suppositions about why they're flying flying sorties there are confirmed. Like, oh, they are present there. Oh, maybe they're planning an offensive there. Oh, we need to spend munitions there. Great, go ahead, blow up our decoys. We're over here doing something else. Oh, absolutely. Chris, can I ask a maybe related question? That's an earlier question about whether it's you know, um, you know small scale or whether is there a, a chair of information at the Ukrainian postgraduate school or there's a G39 like this. Do you think the Ukrainian specifically army has um, like a sophisticated information operations concept and lessons learned system? All this feeds back. Uh, because the sophistication of like confirm or deny, you know, the, the COA uh, or most likely most dangerous course of action kind of thing is very sophisticated and requires persistence and and forethought to you know to uh, to to be able to do that with decoy or deception. It's a really good question about their their level of institutionalization and preparation for this. I think at the outset of the conflict, it was a big pickup game. Or get it. And I think they've gotten a lot better at it over time uh, by keeping at it. So, for example, this factory that has been making all these decoys was some kind of metal fabrication plant that didn't have defense application. And they were looking for something to do. And I think they just kind of on a lark built some stuff and showed it to some guys in the Ukrainian army. Hey, look, what have we made? Can you use these? And, and they said, heck to the yeah, and they reported it back to someone in this, this growing pickup game of information warfare and coordination stuff. And they're like, oh, yes, please. Can you make it do this? If we show you a real one of these, can you make one of these? And, and kind of built that up. But they didn't, they didn't have that before the war. It wasn't a defense industry. It's, it's, it's patriotic domestic industry joining the party. Uh, now, now, some of the stuff, when NATO partners give them certain kinds of things. They also come with some advice on how to use it. But again, I think they started as a pickup game, but they're institutionalizing their pickup game, is my understanding, yeah. at the unclassified level. Interesting. Thanks. Yeah. I do, do remember last uh, year or so ago where there was a lot of emphasis on Ukraine moving toward the Kyrgyz direction, so they were building up. There's going to be this offense in the south, and that's if one day in the cargo direction was very successful. But I don't, I don't know if that was plan to be deception or not, but it seems like they caught the Russian yeah. players in the direction. Yeah, yeah, in the open source, it was presented as if they had, that it was an intentional feint or demonstration coupled by a, 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 a more surprise maneuver. Uh, and, and to the extent to which that was supported, so I think that was an intentional deception at the strategic level. The extent to which it was supported by decoys, I don't know. Culturally, I've heard that like the Russian military has always had, you know, this oh yeah, yeah, yeah. hindrance for uh, you know misdirection and deception kind of thing that it's cultural in the in the Soviet army and now in the Russian army and presumably Ukrainians, you know, that was part of their upbringing. Yeah, they've got a word for it. Maskudovka. Yep. So this That's is this is a, a Russian yes, a military staple concept. Yep. You know, in, in the way that the, the Chinese have Sun Tzu and and all warfare is based on deception. The Russians don't go to Sun Tzu, but they have Maskudovka, which is deception and obfuscation in all things. Yeah. So they're they're all about camouflage and decoys and fakes and feints and, yeah. the, the and complicated crickets. stuff. This is one of, one of the old Spetsnazs. It's the boots that appear to be going the, the opposite way of the way that they're right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Backwards boots, and and yeah, I. I I wouldn't be surprised if the Russian or Soviet style arsenal included some kind of of rake or stompers to make tank tracks. And this is, this is one of the things that I think is so interesting about this particular <laughs> conflict is that all of the Ukrainian forces came up through the same order of battle and okay. all of the same tactics and, and so forth. Uh, you know, all of those people are of my generation and therefore, you know, had some time in the Cold War and 
that can no, it is really interesting because the Ukrainians I have seen be self-reflexive about this. They say, hey, we're we're a Soviet-style army fighting a Soviet-style army. And a smaller Soviet-style army loses to a bigger Soviet-style army. So we need to innovate. Uh, so they're they're pushing the bounds on things that are in the traditional space, Maskirovka, but they're also trying to push the bounds in, in other ways to 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 change. And and I think they've started some NATO leaning structural reforms inside their service, which is, has led to some of their their tactical battlefield successes. But again, I, that, that's not my area of expertise, but that's that's my understanding. But that that broader concept, that that insight, hey, a smaller Soviet style army loses to a bigger Soviet style army. We need to make sure we are doing some things differently is, I think, a really good driving force for battlefield innovation. Might be a lesson for us if you make the analogy. Yeah. <clears throat> Tricky for us because we are not a Soviet-style army, but uh, quantity has a quality all its own. That is something we should do well, not to forget. Even in the ears. Yeah. Uh, so there's Jones. Uh, so here, oh yeah. Just if you go back to one slide, sir. Certainly. So in that last point is one that we miss a lot, right? So we think about this decoys as a deception, but a deception's goal is to go after an adversary decision maker. What a decoy also does is you combine it with other elements of information power is if they keep targeting decoys and not having success, you amplify that. Now that commander is less, there's more hesitant to believe his intel officer, to believe his observer, to believe his pilots, which leads you have an opportunity to sow distrust in the chain of command, which allows a whole bunch of other operations to go in. And that's the part that we even struggle with is capitalizing on those tactical successes to actually get after the strategic objective that we need. Yeah, but, but that's a really good point. So the, the, the decoy is the thing that just keeps paying off for a cost of some hours and some plywood. Uh, I have not only protected the real system wherever it happens to be by getting them to blow up one that isn't, uh, then when they figure out that they've blown up one that isn't, now I'm, I'm right, as you know, I'm, I'm sowing distrust in their ISR and, and maybe their C2 system. Uh, uh, we're wasting munitions where where magazine depth is important. We're creating hesitancy, right? Because if if I know I've wasted a bunch of munitions on decoys, when I see something, I don't immediately direct fires against it. I go, hmm, is it real? Give me another point of observation for verification. So maybe I task another sortie, and and then maybe it falls prey to EW. And now I'm like, mm, I still don't know. Do I want to hmm that that hesitancy? Hesitancy kills, right? As a marine, you know, tempo initiative. Uh, no hesitation, but we're we're creating hesitation. So there's and then yeah, you start layering in other things that we're doing. So again, layering in that EW piece, making it harder for them to get a good observation, making it so they're paying a cost in in ISR attrition as they come close to the to the forward lines and and try to observe these things. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's for me was one of the big takeaways of, of pulling this together. So. Putting it again, putting it in the broader concept of what the heck deception is good for. Here is a collection of the history of deception and stratagem and the kinds of categories it fits into. So there's the, the 10 of these or whatever. The ones on the left are things to which decoys might contribute. The ones on the right are just there for completeness. Those are things that, that you might, kinds of stratagems or deception approaches but maybe not ones in which decoys are particularly relevant. Uh, and, and barring someone wanting to take the discussion elsewhere, I will, I will kind of roll through these. So it's, it's more obvious decoy as a form of, of camouflage. Uh, you're, you're evading detection by distracting and directing detection to something else. Or in this complicated, I know that you know that I know that you know, maybe you're camouflaging your real system as a decoy by hanging something on it that might be a decoy tell. Uh, or just the whole, and it, it's its own category, decoys, uh, using something fake to look like it's, it's real. Uh, and again, all the different things that we've talked about, uh, uh, small forces simulating larger forces, uh, imposing barriers by 
by either implying that there is some kind of capability that that threatens out to a larger area or even something like fake a fake minefield. Somebody isn't going to cross that, but it's safe to do so. Uh, the old the old stratagem of having all of your soldiers set up two tents and light two campfires to just make it look like your force is bigger than it is. And so, so some of these are, are time immemorial. Uh, or things in the, the mimicry or spoofing or disguise space, uh, changing, adding an emitter to something real or adding, adding emitters of some kind, either thermal or other kind of signatures to your decoys to, to make them more plausible. Uh, and the way these things roll into conditioning as well, if, if your adversary is expecting. So if they think, so changing how you're employing your decoys over time. Uh, so if you reach a point where your decoys are getting ignored, why? Can you figure out, based on the kinds of observations the adversary has been able to make, how are they discriminating? What's the tell? Now, can you manipulate that? Can you add that tell to your decoys? Or, and, and again, with military systems, it's harder. Can you take that tell away from your real systems? Probably not, because we, we design these systems to be as as hard to observe and hard to detect as possible, but maybe there's something you can do. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I think one of the other things that I, I'm trying to formulate what I want to say about this, but this is not a total war situation um, in Ukraine. And so, for example, the base that I was working at in Poland, um, one of our contractors was doing things for uh, somebody in Ukraine as well. And so some of their employees were transiting uh, through the airport there and all of that kind of stuff. And so I, I think that that on the one hand, that may lend itself to uh, other utilizations of these different types of, of um, distractions, decoys and, and mimicry and so forth. But on the other hand, I, I wonder, should the um, Russian hierarchy determine that they want to shift to more of a total war thing and, and, and move forward with that, how that may end up changing this current dynamic uh, and, and the current utilization of some of these things that we're seeing right now? What specifically do you have in mind? That, that's hard to say. I think that, um, you know, we've we, the United States, has been uh, building up quite a bit of, of things in southern Poland as, as well, and, and, and southeastern Poland. And, and so I, I, I do wonder what um, some of these contractors that are doing work in Ukraine May may do, but um, kind of going back to I guess uh, I did miss Dr. Butzman's uh, conversation. I'm sorry about that, but the article that I had read about the Australian company that was making these cardboard drones and so forth, and and so just the, those kinds of innovations that are finding their way into the Ukrainian arsenal. Um, it, it seems like that that still works well as long as you've got this hey we're still using the airport we're still able to fly into you know um, this area so certainly there are parts that are experiencing more of a total war type of uh scenario some some parts of the countryside are certainly in that kind of environment and yet i that's what i'm saying i'm having a hard time shaping how to maximize the current situation yeah, and so it is definitely an interesting characteristic of the conflict that supply lines into Western Ukraine remain open. Yeah, so you can you can fly stuff in, you can drive stuff in. It's it, it's it's not that hard to get material in. And the challenge is sometimes what do you want to send? How much of it do you want to send? And then issues with integrating into the Ukrainian force. What are they comfortable with using? And so and so I guess for me, part of that goes back to my study of of the Vietnam War, whether that was um, with the French at, and and Dien Bien Phu, or you know the uh, the Americans at Case on in '67, um, just 
uh, having, you know, again, it's a different scenario where you have Russians who you're not able to distinguish because, oh, that guy's Ukrainian and he's Russian. I can totally tell the difference between those two guys like, versus an American fighting force or a French fighting force in and the Vietnamese, you know, and stuff. So, so that again becomes kind of an interesting concept in terms of how how these things are taking shape. I'm not exactly sure what thread I want to draw from that, but I. I well, I'll, I'll take something out of your remarks that may have been implied or as a subtext. But one one thing when we're talking about decoys or deceptions of any kind is the difference between misleading and militarily appropriate deceptions and perfidy. So there are things that are perfidious that you are not allowed to do, like put troops in Red Cross marked ambulances for, for maneuver or assault, or uh, put on enemy uniforms and purport to be enemy combatants. Uh, there, there are things like that that are, that are verboten under the, the laws of armed conflict. Uh, but that that does you know, so that that is less tempting in a fight where the, the principal combatants are phenotypically different, whereas you know Eastern Europeans look like Eastern Europeans by and large. Maybe some of the different tribes of humanity in that area are very distinctive, but not so much all of them. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm not aware of of that level of deception bordering on perfidy going on in the conflict. Sure. Yeah. And we have a couple of questions online. Oh, great. We got some questions online. Fire them off. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to basically what is the application of these decoys to, to U.S. strategy? I bring it back to where we are at MPS, how you might tie those together. Yeah, for sure. So so in, in land conflict, the kinds of benefits the Ukrainians are drawing are the kinds of benefits that we could draw. Uh, <clears throat> the Ukrainians have these really high quality decoys, but they're full up and you have to physically move them. Uh, it, it works well because the factory is in Ukraine and they move them from that factory to where they need them to be. So things that are lightweight and easily assemblable. So we should we should improve our arsenal of either inflatables or of easy to assemble kits and recognize this this stuff about uh, uh, different ways to discern drones. You know, do all our uh, discern decoys. Do all of our Decoy kits have the, the right heat generator and right signal generator in them to, to minimize the number of different ways other than getting close to them and seeing that they're inflatable, that those might be discerned. Uh, and, and some of the, the thoughts about employment, you know, the, the insight that by pushing fake HIMARS further forward, you, you expand the enemy's perception of threat. You know, I think most of the time when we're thinking of decoys, we're either thinking of a big England shadow core style. Uh, are we are we creating a, an environment where they think there's a whole big different formation that they have to worry about, or kind of kind of tactical level things? Hey, uh, I want you to blow up that balloon rather than my actual tank. There's there's more ways to think about it. Paul, if I could add on, sure. to that, I think the other big takeaway is. We got to get back in the game. <laughs> we aren't doing this stuff. Period. Very, very little in the U.S. military is being done. There's some pockets of goodness, but very little is being done with decoys. In the U.S. military. I mean, if anyone, I mean, there's a handful of people that I know of that are in the game, and we've got to get our baseline maneuver elements, start training it, and utilize some of those things and get after. Them. Yeah, I, I think that is certainly true for the ground forces. I think the Navy has some stuff. Uh, and I think if we were to go to the civil, we could talk more about who has what and who doesn't. But I think the general observation that, boy, they're getting they're, the Ukrainians are making a lot of money for, with this. And at relatively low investment, we could be pre prepared and postured to, to do better. And the earlier comment about a, you know, a large Soviet army defeats a small Soviet army, and you look at the PLA and the PLAN and the United States, like we are going to be at the disadvantage number wise for the first time, you know, a long, long time, if always, you know, forever. So, um, so these are the kind of things that we really need to be thinking about where you get you know, exponential return on your investment. You can't just like 
mass and firepower, you know, and attrition will win the day. Does he have anything else? I'm good. Yeah, last good. question, man. We just got to break go down and what the PLA and what Russia do on a daily basis. They pull this stuff out of the warehouse every time they go and train. Yep. Do you have a question, no, Connor? Actually, we just thinking, you know, with the the current application of tech, I, I thought it would be easier for us in terms of the batch. Mm. Right. And I, I, there's something that perhaps is missing out here is the usage of such tech. I think it, it could be as simple as, you know, having a TI enabled drones that could easily pick up between a rubber tank and a picture tank. This kind of type, this kind of signature. And I think we can go on to a little bit more complex in using like AI to develop some form of like testing scoring to decipher whether it's I thought even though you know the US Army uh isn't have, haven't had this kind of capability in terms of decoys, but uh if we could overcome such deception, I, I thought that that would be suffice. Yeah, so that, that that is another another side of it, right? So there's there's the the deceivers versus the detectors, and and hey, this is this is how we train AI, right? This is a generative adversarial network, uh, or, so let's apply that logic. But it, it it comes down to the contested signals environment, the contested observation environment, right? If if your observation platform is at constant threat of being jammed, disabled, or shot down. And if you're only allowed fleeting glances, and if you're cheap, like the Russians, and you've been investing in the wrong things or squandering your, your defense budget, uh, maybe you don't have the best drones with the best sensors with the with high survivability. And, and so, But in an environment where one side does, if the other side has a lot of decoys and they never get serviced, uh, that's wasted investment. So that that is a good point. Thank you for raising it. And I, I think we'll oh, yeah. wrap with that. Thank yeah. you very much. Great, thanks. If you have interest in this topic, I would suggest uh, engaging directly with Dr. Paul uh, for your thesis or other research you're doing. And then also Mike Owen. Captain Owen is the uh, is the information warfare chair here at Naval Postgraduate School. Also looking at uh, at this topic and how it can be uh, integrated in for what the Navy is doing. So thanks. Next one, two weeks. Uh, commercial uh, use of commercial space will be the topic. Dr. Wenchel Lamb will uh, present. Thank you.